Yeah, I think every single guest that we've ever considered, we ask ourselves the one question, which is, will they add value? Yeah. What audience, you guys, which are primarily men? Once you experience having children and what they really mean to you, you know, it's 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 such a, you know, that, that feeling that you have, and then you know what that, that feeling will, you're going to have for that baby, you know, and experiencing that and what they grow up like and whatever else, and to have that taken away from you, it's just... It's unimaginable as well. And I think this is something that people will question because with that sort of style you always do, and I, I did in fairness, but it's obviously his fundamentals. Um, but certainly rolling with him and chatting to him, you know, it, it, as far as I can see, his fundamentals are fucking solid as well. No, it was good. It was good. It's just, it was nice to have a different opinion on nutrition. But one thing I will say is I, I agree with, um, I agree with his concept. If that makes sense. It's not that I didn't agree with his concept. I just think it's a dangerous premise to go out and say, don't worry about calories to people that are not going to keep to a carnival diet 100%. Um, but in the UK, at least, uh, yeah, death by suicide is, is the biggest killer of men under 50, um, which is insane. Um, even even in, in sort of teenagers and children, so those sort of 19 and younger is the second biggest killer. How you getting on with the carnival? Yeah, good, mate. I feel, I think, I said to you last. Are you still, are you still doing it, like, fully, or yeah. have you been dipping in and out? No, 100%, mate. Lost, have you lost weight? Not that much, actually, but my no. physique's changed fucking loads. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's changed lots, mate, but, yeah, I don't know, mate. It's all good, though, I think. Yeah. Right, here we are again, mate. Let's go. Yeah, welcome back to the Everyday Perspective. Today's guest is nobody, it's just Danny and I, <laughs> once again. Talking shit. Yep, yeah, as always. <laughs> Um, guys if you're listening and you're enjoying the content massive ask from us straight away please like and subscribe to the channel um, obviously our numbers are growing and it just allows us to get more and more guests um, so more guests better guests more information so help us out hit the subscribe button and the like never goes amiss as well so today what's the plan mate well we're going to go back over all our all, all our old episodes yeah. what are we going from 10 to 20 let's go from our last episode so the all episode was episode 12. 12, okay. Yeah, so we'll work through episode 13 right through to where we're at. Um, at the point of recording this, we've got 23 done and dusted. Yep. So last time we attempted this, mate, we fucking were all over the place. And I ended up talking <laughs> about loads of my shit, which probably brought people fucking to sleep. So this time I had to stay on track yeah, and actually right. listen to uh, or chat through the episode. So episode 13 is actually our sponsor as well, um, which is Angela Service. Yeah. So, uh, guys, we'll pop the uh, the banner or the, the card up here if you want to go check out the episode. Um, but this one was specifically around testosterone deficiency um, and the fact that that could be why men are depressed. So what are your thoughts on that episode, mate? Just fucking loads of information, mate, wasn't it? Loads of information. You know, me personally, I went and got my, my bloods checked. And, yeah, I had a deficiency. And she's she's looking after me at the moment. So, yeah, if, I, if, if, if she didn't come on, I probably wouldn't have checked it, you know? Yeah, it was an interesting one, I thought, because um, obviously the, the, the female menopause in the last probably couple of years has been massive. Um, and it's, you know, Angela mentioned about how when the media gets behind an agenda, yeah, and we see this a lot with just men's health in general, I think, but, you know, they, they really start pushing it. And you've seen loads of traction as a result of that for females um, around the menopause. And there's lots of guidance around exercise and GPs and sort of the medical professionals are now far more informed about how to deal with women that are experiencing those symptoms. But it feels like from what Angela's saying that men maybe in a much slower way develop those same symptoms or can do, but yet we're maybe 10 years behind. So it's great to hear that there's GPs like Angela who specialize in those things. And yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked those about men's mental health and, you know, we'll come on to Andy's man club and the support that they provide and, you know, way back into our first episode, we had Dr. Will on from a GP perspective talking about what he sees. Um, you know, we know that men's mental health is a massive problem. Um, and it was something that I never thought about. You know, we, we kind of take the approach in the podcast that we're like, guys, like, you know, have a listen, here's some information, you know, get your alcohol straight, get your, your drug taken straight, get your exercise straight, get some guys around you, and that might start improving your situation. What I didn't account for is the fact that guys might be hormone deficient, and that shit just is way beyond their capability at the moment. Yeah, well, exactly that, isn't it? It's exactly that. It's, you don't realise that how much it's... What, me being in my industry and what I do, I, I, I train a lot of women that are going through menopause. 
and I see the impact it gives gives them for years. You know what I mean? That it's fucking terrible. And I don't think I think the difference is with men and women is women's um, women's symptoms are a lot more aggressive. You know, they they do they they go like a beetroot. They sweat night sweats so badly. You know they you know they they got no sex drive. They they're, they're fucking miserable. You know some women that really go for it are really fucking miserable. Whereas I think. <coughs> Whereas I think with men, I think because if you've got low testosterone, you don't quite get the same symptoms and they're not as dramatic as women. So, you know, we can carry on our day-to-day lives, but we'll be fucking miserable with it. Do you know what I mean? We'll just carry on mowing through, doing what we need to do, you know, going to work, doing all that shit, but still feeling like shit. But we're not, we're not getting the huge sweats or we're not getting you know we're just putting on weight <laughs> feeling fucking depressed feeling worthless and then that, i think that's the big difference and i think until we as a nation especially with the nhs the, the nhs cannot get women's menopause medication the the way they do it is is fucking shit you know straight from you know when when a woman go starts experiencing menopause to them when they see a doctor you know if they see the wrong doctor they can get prescribed antidepressants you know i've had i've had i've had clients that have been prescribed antidepressants before they're prescribed hrt which is which is fucking mental but like you said before and that's that's with all these horrendous symptoms i think for men when we get very little or we're just feeling low mood or we're feeling like shit putting on weight and all those different types of stuff i just think it's going to take a lot, I think, for the NHS especially to catch up. Yeah, and, and like you said, mate, you're, you're right that so many women have been mistreated and misdiagnosed for, for years. But I think that that is starting to move a little bit now because of all the, the media pressure and all the, the new sort of information and research available. But yeah, I think for, for men with their hormones, uh, uh, there's a bit of a way to go still. Um, but as you say, it's, it's that longer it's that longer sort of um, development of the symptoms, the manifestation of it is so much longer as well, isn't it? So... Yeah, I think although symptoms can be similar, normally they are much slower. And one thing that Angela said that, that, that really kind of resonated with me a little bit was not to normalise symptoms, you know, and it's very much, oh, it's just old age, isn't it? You know, I haven't got libido anymore, just old age. I haven't got much energy, just old age. But actually those are symptoms of potentially deficiency and they shouldn't be normalised. And, and the other thing I hear a lot, especially with men over 45, 50, is they'll come in and go, wow, 50, you know, I'm 50 now, you know what I mean? And they're like, oh, well, I'll, I'll clean up my diet and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll exercise more and that'll fix all my problems. And knowing now what I know, I'm like, let's get a blood test. Let's just check that straight away. And there's times where there's men in their fifties and their testosterone's absolutely fine. So they are just not eating correctly. They're drinking too much and they're not exercising enough. So then that's great. But I think as a baseline, people, especially as they get older, they should they should get their bloods done and they should get their bloods done as soon as they can. Because one of the things that Angela said to me personally is she would have liked to have seen my bloods 10 years ago. And the reason is, is because she couldn't understand why my, my bloods, you know, the testosterone was so low um, over the last three or four years. But she was like, oh, if, if I could see, you know, you might have had a low baseline. And then you might have dropped two levels, but your your original baseline could have been like twelve, yeah. and that's what you function at, yeah. you know. Because I've not, even even now, even though you know she's she's helping me, I've not, you know, I don't I didn't feel like as if I was like needing that much help. Do you know what I mean? I felt a bit tired and stuff, but I train a lot, so I was like, oh, it's just because I train fucking loads, you know. Yeah, but it's it's yeah, it's like you said, it's it's very relative, and because things are so slow to progress and creep up on you. You just gradually over time will get used to feeling a certain way. And I think it's just being aware of that. But, you know, I think we've talked before about obviously this podcast and and sponsorships and that type of thing. And we've said from the start that we wouldn't take sponsorship from people that we didn't feel passionate about. Yeah, 100%. Or things we didn't feel passionate about. And the reason that we, we, we sponsored or partnered with Angela is because we believe in what she's doing. If she was selling booze or gambling, we probably would tell her to do one. <laughs> yeah, well, hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, the fact that she, you know, that the, the fact that we've got her as a sponsor, I think tells our audience that we completely buy in and, and, and believe what she's what she's sort of saying. So I think on that, I think if guys are feeling, you know, sort of low mood, social withdrawal was a massive one that she talked about as well, um, which is quite interesting, really, because I never think about that. You never think about, you know, that as you get older. Yeah, I feel like as you get older, you just 
tend to want to stay in more maybe, but it might be that you are just getting fucking low. Look, your testosterone's getting lower and you're feeling a little bit, you know, anxious and, you know, not as confident as you once were and all those different things. And then the, all those factors then factor into, I'll oh, just fucking stay in. <laughs> not going to go out. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's definitely one to be aware of. So yeah, I think that, um, yeah, obviously any of the other symptoms that you talked about as well, I think it's, you know, if you're experiencing any of that, you know, if you know anybody experiencing any of that, then you should definitely look to, to reach out and, and get an appointment booked with them and get your bloods done. Because ultimately you don't know, you know, you might be fine, you know, and, and like you, I did the same. I went and got my bloods done. I was okay. I was within a normal range. So then that put it back on me a little bit. Like, right, am <laughs> yeah. I drinking too much? He's a bit <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it suddenly put the accountability back on me. Yeah. Um, so I started, you know, making sure that I was taking my vitamins, making sure that I was eating better, doing my exercise. So at the very least, that knowledge is power, isn't it? So if there is a deficiency, medically you can get support. If it's not, then maybe use that as a bit of accountability to actually take more action yourself. And, and like what you said, though, I felt I was the other way. I felt like I should have been further along than what I was physically with the amount I train and I eat really well. So it's not like as if I wasn't eating well. I know I've lost, lost like three and a half stone this year, but even then I was like thinking oh, fucking I'm eating like 80% perfect you know I might have a little takeaway on the weekend or something like that but I'll train him once or twice a day and and I wasn't seeing the results that I was seeing maybe four or five years ago you know so that was that was probably the, the biggest indicator but even still I was putting it down to age I'm only 33 I was thinking <laughs> oh you know I might be just like I'm in my 30s now you know yeah that's it it's a decline after 30 isn't it but <laughs> yeah. yeah it's not that fucking sharp so. yeah but mate on, on a little side note there your fucking weight loss journey has been pretty impressive this year though yeah, you, you can see it in the episodes, mate. Yeah, I was no, looking back. Like, just... If you haven't seen the early episodes, go back and check them out just for, just to see Danny's chubby chops. Like it's worth <laughs> it. But mate, you can see it in the episodes. Yeah. Even in these like twenty three episodes, twenty three weeks that this is going out, it's it's yeah, it's been been remarkable. I think mate. it's just jujitsu, mate. I think it's just I've got a a cardio outlet that I enjoy. Yeah. So when I used to play football, I used to enjoy that. So you know, you do that, and then when I quit football or retired from football, you know, going to the gym's great. And I love weight training, but it's not going to keep you trim unless you want to be like perfectly, you know, fucking right into your diet, which again, it's, it's, you know, if you want to be a bodybuilder, that's great. But most people can't be fucking asked, you know, you want to live a good life and you want to, you want to have treats and you want to do things like that. So I think the big difference for me is just having, like I said, a cardio outlet that I could spend two hours on the mats burn however many calories how many calories do you burn when you're on your whoop like a thousand odds yeah, you know at times it varies, mate. if it's if it's a technical session it's probably around four or five hundred but if it's you know if we're doing even half an hour of sparring on the back of that and it's moderate to high intensity sparring yeah. then yeah fucking hell it's like thousand calories yeah easy, that's crazy, session, isn't it? You know and that's what i mean so that that's a huge you know if you do that some days i do that twice a day yeah. you know what i mean i do a technical session in the morning and i might just do an hour hour and 20 minutes of, of sparring in the afternoon so then i end up you know <laughs> burning all these fucking calories and then i know as long as i'm watching what i'm eating relatively you know so a lot of the times now i'll just miss breakfast and people are like, oh you know but you just count your calories you know and i know we, me and paris had this debate <laughs> but, but at the same time calories are king you know yeah. and if you want to eat what you want to eat and not have to be restricted in your diet at all if you do do just count your calories you know you they will create that deficit you will lose weight yeah hold that thought because we'll come on to his episode because yeah. I've, I've got some thoughts on that as well yeah. which, uh, which would be good to chat through um, so yeah so next we had uh, Simon Bennett so episode 14 so I, I've changed the, the title of this episode since we released it right okay because when we released it originally it was when the cost of living crisis was really big yeah. in the press um, and also Nuffield did their Healthier Nation Index um, which showed that the the cost of living crisis had a huge impact on people's mental well being. Um, it was up in the sixties um, of, of those surveyed. Said it's that, a crazy statistic, on it? Yeah, but it's it, crazy. It's, but you know, we we talk about what we want. You know, obviously, we just talked about hormone deficiency and everything else, and obviously, finance is a huge factor. So I, I was really pleased to get Simon on. Um, the episode now is called "Expert Advice on How to Protect and Grow Your Wealth," um, and it was great having him on because there's loads of people. Um, that are out, you know, on the internet, giving financial advice that just aren't qualified. And we yeah. talked on an early episode about the Dunning Kruger effect, where people don't know what they don't know, and often will give people really bad advice because they're just so oblivious to the, to what the right thing to do is. And Simon is is you know he's dual qualified, so he's uh, he's a financial planner, a regulated financial planner, 
Um, so you can, you know, help you plan your finances, but he's also a wealth manager as well. So that's where you can grow it and, and think about the stock market and everything else. So yeah, I liked that episode um, because it was really, it was well-structured in the sense that we kind of started from the very beginning, right? You, you know, you're kind of in your first job. You haven't got much money behind you. But, you know, how do you avoid debt spirals? How do you maybe start building a little bit of wealth? Um, you know, not much, but just enough. And then the various steps from there. So yeah, I really liked it. What did you think? Yeah, I enjoyed it. It wasn't, um, I think the big thing I took away from the episode was just, there's no magic pill to take to get rich, you know? And that's, that's the thing that people are always looking for, isn't it? They listen to every financial advisor, every promise, you know, from fucking some Instagram geezer <laughs> saying you can get rich doing this. <laughs> You can get rich doing this, rich doing that, you know, and it's all fucking bullshit. So listen to Simon and it is just planning. It is, if you're going to put X amount away every month, then put that away, you know. It, you don't live beyond your means, you know, and if you do eventually get to a point where you've got a good job and enough savings, then there's loads of options that you can go and invest in. Um, it was quite interesting to hear him talk about the, the housing market and how that's kind of died and stuff like that, as in, you know, you, you've got millionaires that have got 20 houses, but they can't afford to turn the fucking lights on, stuff like that, which I thought was quite quite interesting. Um, but yeah, I think that was, that was my main my main takeaway from it, is, is plan, just plan, just just look at your finances and don't live beyond your means, especially in this, in this environment at the moment. I think it's uh, definitely a time to like, you know, really look at what you need, you know, and uh, there's a few things that I think most people need is obviously to live... <laughs> to uh to pay for the houses you know things like cars and stuff like that that's the big things i think people should start looking at if like me personally like no cars on finance i've spent years having nice cars but always paying for them on finance but that would take up 500 pound 600 pound a month for my fucking income that was more than my mortgage you know just on cars so the one thing i would say is things like that those those expenses just to look you know more more or just to look better than what you are, you know, it's 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 pointless at times. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think I agree with most of that. I think for me that the main takeaways again were um, it was it was probably um, like like we talked about with nutrition and calories and everything else, but just getting a hang of what you're doing, what's going in, what's you know what, what's going, what's coming in, what's going out. So doing that financial audit that we kind of talked about with Mark as well. So I think that's that's really key. And then I think like you said, I think it's it's not an overnight thing. Um, you know, it does take years of of working hard, being mindful of where your money's going, you know, sort of thinking about what you're spending and what you can cut back. And then the other thing that I thought was really interesting as well, which is when he said that basically taking, like, what did he say? He said, uh, he said doing nothing is still like a risk. Yeah, um, yeah that was good, yeah. And, and it made perfect sense because you asked the question about, is it all right just to leave your money in your bank? Like, why can't you just leave your money in your bank? And he explained, obviously, that the, the, the rate of interest that you get from your money is lower and slower than the rate of inflation. So actually, by if you've got, you know, a £1,000 a day in the bank, that's worth a £1,000 a day. But in maybe five years' time, that might only be worth £800 yeah. because of, of that switch. So it was... Um, so that was really interesting. And it made me really think about how you need to kind of think about investing your money. And then the other thing I thought about as well, which was, was really cool, is when he said about the, and this is the bit that takes time, was, you know, sort of three, six, nine, which was obviously three months, six months, nine months salary. So it's a bare minimum, three months salary in the bank, liquid as he called it. And this might be, I don't know, in a, you know, this is what I've done, you know, at the moment I've put some money away in like a, an easy access saving account, um, which again, isn't quite there with inflation, but there's some accounts where you can get 5%. Um, there's there's loads that you can get three percent at the moment, so the interest rates obviously have gone up, and therefore you can sort of get something back. Yeah. And then once you've achieved that, you know, and you've got enough money to pay your bills, you've got a little bit of money away in case something were to happen. Then that kind of remainder, like how can you really yeah. work for you? And that's when you look at the stocks and shares ISO, which is what he talked about. Um, and, and I thought that was just really sensible advice. And Obviously, he talked about the fact that you should definitely hire a professional. And we've had several people at Trev's, another one who there's certain things in life that you just don't want to fuck up. Yeah. And finance and your will is probably two of them. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, if you can go to a financial advisor, but at the very least, you know, there's, there's lots of platforms now where you can just open a, 
at stocks and shares ISO, select your level of risk. You could go low risk, really conservative if you want. And was, at least it's doing something. I was looking at um, a couple of the apps. There's one called like Emma or something like that. And it's uh, just a financial planning app. And there's another one called like Plum something, yeah. Plums. Yeah. And you, you trade on Plums, but it, it connects your bank account. It connects, you know, if you spend, I don't know, £5.70 at the shops, it'll put 30p in a savings pot for you. You know, it'll, it'll show you where all your outgoings are. You can even... I think now you can even see like what you're spending your money on if you if you pay like the four ninety nine premium version where you can set like a you know a lot of my clients when I speak to them and we talk about their money and this and that and then we go through bits and pieces you know so that they can afford personal training and we look at it and we're like okay how much are you spending on food a month like <laughs> do you know what I mean and then they go through and they're like oh fucking hell, I'm spending four hundred pound on like shit food you know so an app like I think it was Emma they they literally will go right you will spend it in four, five, six, seven hundred pounds a month on these, these, these places, a co-op, a Tesco's, or whatever, you know, and then when, when it's in front of you like that, though, you can look at it and think, fucking, I need to sort that out. I need to sort that out because there's a huge chunk of my money going on just shit. Because let's be honest, if you go co-op now, you know, say you're nipping home from work and you're like, oh, I need to pick up tea. That'll cost you 20 quid. I know, it's mad. 25 quid. Easy. I'll say it to Kirstie all the time. I'm like, let's, we've got to fucking stop it. Not in a, like we are really good at planning, but there's obviously times because of lo- how life is. Like you just haven't got something ready, or we're running late, or whatever. Like oh, we'll just go co co op and grab X Y Z, grab some steaks, or grabs like this. And it's one of those things in it where like part of you is like I should be able to fucking go into a shop and buy what I want. Yeah. Like why can't I? Yeah. But then it comes back to like what you actually want long term. Long term, yeah. You know, and should you be spending that money when you've probably can you know prepare something at home and, and buy it in bulk or whatever? So, so yeah, I thought that was really interesting, but. You know, I, I bank with Monzo, um, and they—it's like a—it's a—it's basically an app-based bank. So they don't actually have any real banks, um, but it's all like uh, protected by the financial services compensation scheme. So it's all legit, um, <clears throat> and they do the exact same thing. So all of that stuff you just talked about is all built in for free in their banking app. That's, good, that's clever, um, and it's really user-friendly. Um, this sounds. <laughs> like I'm 10, but it's really colorful and lots of little <laughs> icons. So it's really yeah. easy to like, it's not fucking boring and gray. Like, yeah. you know, some apps it's, it's it quite poppy and it. It's quite hot. Is it quite easy to see where your but money's I, going? I think a lot of banks like that though, end up and <laughs> they'll end up taking over the, the big, big, big companies because you got a fucking Lloyd's or something now. It's boring as fucking it. You know what I mean? It's still so serious and they've shut all their branches down now. Virtually you can't ever go and see anyone or, or do anything. So you might as well go with these, these newer banks sometimes because they're offering more than what a traditional bank is. You know, they offer more services. Like you said, I, I've not used Monzo, but if they're offering all that stuff within that, then I would just open up that account. And then instead of having Emma and that, I would just have that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, and, and money box is another one that you can connect yeah. your sports spending up to. So there's loads of options, but uh, it, yeah, again, if you've not watched this episode, um, yeah, definitely go and watch it. We'll put like, like, like with Angela's with all the episodes today, as we go through them, we'll put the, uh, the link up here so people can check it out. But it's a really informative episode, not the most sort of exciting one. There's no funny stories or anything like that, but really good information around your finances. All right, next. So we had episode 15. So this was uh, life after pro football. With uh, Gary Sawyer, yeah, I love that. Yeah, love I thought it, you did, yeah. mate. Go on, what do you think of this one? This, 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 this was. Uh, it was a great shout in the end. It was a great episode, but um, this was obviously you kind of were the driving force about getting Gary on. I yeah. wasn't that keen, primarily because I'm not a football fan. Yeah, but yeah, it was a really good episode in the end. But yeah, what do you think? Did you enjoy oh, it? I loved it. Yeah. yeah, I think for every football fan, though, in in general, you, every, you always want to hear what goes on behind the scenes. You know, you see what they do on the pitch, you know, but it's all the stuff behind the scenes. And I think that's why a lot of these new documentaries that they started bringing out on Amazon and stuff like that, they've become so popular. You know, you've got the Arsenal one, the Tottenham one, you've got the Wrexham one now. Um, but the reason they are so popular is because you see what they're like on the pitch, but you don't really see what they're like off the pitch because it's very sheltered. You know, football is living this, this fucking glass bubble and it's not like jujitsu where you got a top jujitsu guy and he's just, a fucking regular guy and he'll come and speak to you and he'll interact with people because you know he's a normal guy he's not but with footballers they're they're in this fucking fishbowl and they're not allowed out of it 
because they're so protected. You know, they got to protect their appearance. They got to make sure they don't say the wrong things, you know, because there's so much money involved. You know, even someone like Gary, who, who he had a great career, you know, he had a fucking like a class career, especially talking to him. You know, you don't realize all the different steps that he went through to get where he is. But yeah, for me, mate, it was, it was class, you know, and I hope to get more footballers on. You yeah. Know? Yeah, we'll try and get a few on. But yeah, I, I enjoyed it, mate. He was he was such a nice guy as well, which always helps. He was he was cool to hang out with. And um as much as I'm not a football fan now and I, I joke about it, I play I played football throughout my entire childhood. You know, I was a, I was a glory fan as a kid. So so I always always watched football and it was only as I'd become an adult really and I think my my hopes of being a professional goalkeeper were shattered. Um and I found fighting that I, I kind of fell out of love with football a little bit. But yeah, I mean I was very passionate about it for many years of my life. So it was quite interesting to hear about it. And I think for me, just being a bit more, being a bit geeky perhaps with like the sports science and the training side of stuff, I just liked hearing about all that, like and how, how the athletes can develop. So I thought it was a good mix of funny stories and there were some fucking funny stories. Um, and, and yeah, and then good information around kind of managing nerves, around the training, um, obviously injuries, everything else. So yeah, I really enjoyed that episode. Yeah, I loved it. Loved it. Yeah, and um, it's not. But I think we've got it booked in now. But we've obviously got a guy coming on. I won't mention his name in case he he, he bails. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he's a uh, he's a sort of um, football sport development sort of coach and yeah. at university level. So he's hopefully going to come on and and build on a little bit of what Gary was saying actually as well about sort of if you're a parent, um, like for you exactly. Yeah, so if you're a parent, you've got a young lad or girl these days that, you know, obviously girls football's getting massive as well. Um, and you want to develop them into being a pro, this guy's going to come on and, and give us all the really informa good information about how you can maybe support your kids. Yeah, I'm, thing, bu I'm, I'm buzzing to listen to that because yeah. even from my boy's point of view, you know, he's not, I, I, I always say it, most of these kids are not going to be pros. Well, you know, there's such a tiny percentage that actually make it, you know, and most of them are like phenomenons from fucking day dot, you know. There's a few though that slip through, like Gary. Like he didn't get signed up till later. You know, that does happen. People develop at different times. Especially as they get, you know, you get these kids that are like amazing at six years old. By the time they're 13, 14, sometimes they're not as good because physically they change and, you know, people catch up and uh, and all that. It's a, it's a really weird age, but I'm really interested to hear what he's got to say about stuff like that. You know, because my, my lab personally, he's, he's, he's quite good technically. But physically, he's he's always been a little bit behind. He's never been a great runner, you know. He's he's never been the the you know. You get some lads that are up and down, up and down, you know, really strong runners. He's not. He's never been like that. But I think it's developed him in different ways. So I'm interested to hear if he thinks as has he as he goes through puberty and as he gets bigger and stronger. You know, he's he's quite a big, tall lad. How he thinks that because he's not been physically that great, so he's had to develop the technical side of his game, you know, and he's still once he does uh, develop the physical side, will he then accelerate even more? You know, that's what I'm interested in seeing. You know, if he if he does get fit, like really fit, and then does grow and get stronger and everything else, is there like a medium ground where, you know, that's how that's how people do become pros later. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, definitely. So I think that'd be a good episode. So uh, yeah, check out Gary's episode. Get yourself excited about a bit of football and then, uh, yeah, maybe dial back in in the next few weeks and we'll get the uh, that episode on as well so yeah it was good that was fun and yeah as you say hopefully uh, get some more footballers on and, and maybe some sort of active you know sort yeah. Of some, some yeah there's someone else we're talking about talking to that might mm. be able to come on it'd be a cool one it'd yeah. be a really cool one yeah we'll, uh, we'll keep on that it'd be good awesome All right. so episode 16 so this was our man Callum so uh, obviously seeking, seeking asylum for 15 years um, mad story like such a lovely guy as well heartbreaking really yeah, and it, you, you know, it's, uh, it's a combination of heartbreaking and just infuriating as well. Yeah. And I guess to some extent, the, the, the British government and the Home Office now have obviously changed their stance on immigration. Um, it was obviously all over the news just maybe about a month ago. And a lot of that is because I think they recognise there were families like this who were just getting lost in, in a broken system. Um, but yeah, hearing his fucking story, mate, was... And I think because he, so, he was so like good about it, I That's think crazy. I'd be so fucking angry. Yeah, but you I think because I mean? of his faith and and obviously he talked about jujitsu, but had a really positive impact on him as well. Um, but yeah, I think he's obviously tried taking like you know the, the positives from that. Yeah, really bad situation. But Especially yeah. when he's doing lots of charity work and stuff. You know, he he really does give back, and you know, you know, you know, he's going to be a successful doctor. You know, he's he's gonna he's got that drive. He's going to go on and do that. And yeah, it's not there's not too much to say about that episode because it's it's all about the story. Yeah. It's all about the story. Like anyone who's not watched it, 
you know, go and watch it. Just go and listen. You know, it is so, it is so compelling. You know, if you've got any sort of um, pre-perceived ideas on asylum seekers, just, just go and watch this. And it definitely changed my perception of them. You know, it definitely changed my perception of asylum seekers and what they have to go through, you know, to even be in this country and, you know, all those different types of stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Go check that one out. Okay, next was episode 17. So unlock your body, move and eat, how evolution intended. The Paris, Paris, Paris Pain Project. <laughs> yeah. Um, fucking love Paris. He's I was so, about to say, yeah. Such a, such an interesting guy. Um, knowledgeable, very knowledgeable. Oh, knows his stuff. Unbelievable. And um, obviously very certain in his opinions as well. Um, it, it ended up being a slightly frustrating episode for me. It was, I forgot my glasses for once. My eyes were fucked, so that didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we, we were hoping to get some content from Paris in regard to jujitsu specifically, because he's a very experienced physiotherapist, has worked um, for many, many years in, in professional rugby, is, is done martial arts himself, uh, is very good, you know, with the shoulders and, and obviously creating, you know, sort of correct movement patterns, which for something like jujitsu, where you know, anybody that does it or has ever seen it, you'll know that you need to be strong in all sorts of weird positions. You need to be able to contort your body, but also be strong through positions as well. So we were hoping to get some really good content there and um, partly due to our own limitations and, and, you know, a few other bits, but obviously we went down the, the rabbit hole of nutrition, um, which was something that we weren't really sort of prepared to have a discussion around. Um, and yeah, ultimately just ran out of time. So, um, so we, we still, you know, have an open door to Paris and hope he does come back on. We've been in talks about getting him back on to maybe finish up what we started yeah. um, and try and get that episode where we do talk about how to bulletproof your body for jujitsu, which is kind of what we wanted. Um, but obviously you had a bit of a back and forth with him, mate. <laughs> he touched on that earlier. So, uh, so yeah, how did you find that episode in hindsight? No, it was good. It was good. It's just, it was nice to have a different opinion on nutrition. But one thing I will say is I, I agree with, um, I agree with his concept that makes sense it's not that i didn't agree with his concept i just think it's a dangerous premise to go out and say don't worry about calories to people that are not going to keep to a carnival diet 100 percent. that's that was the only thing if you're going to keep to a carnival diet 100 percent, i can completely see his is saying you know you wouldn't need to w really worry about counting calories you would your, your physique would change you would lose body fat there's no doubt about it because of how uh, the ketogenic system works it, it it changes how you metabolize your fat in your body and how it how how that happens you know but um yeah i just i just you know we weren't ready i wish i wish i knew going into it that he was uh you know a strict carnival because we could have come up with some data and we could have had a bit more of a an in-depth to and fro. Yeah, I mean, he did, he did mention it to, to me that he was. Um, I just don't think I realised how much of a big role it played in his practice. Um, so obviously he talked about his fundamentals, which was obviously around the, the movement screen, so the functional movement screen, and then obviously the nutrition, and then the sort of mindset and philosophy, um, which we didn't quite get onto. Um, but yeah, I was the same, mate. It was one of these things. I mean, I've got a, a level five diploma in nutritional sciences, so I know a little bit about nutrition. Um, and the course that I did was heavily, heavily leaned towards, you know, being purely evidence-based, you know, only using what the evidence has proven in regard to what you're telling people. And most of the evidence does lean towards calories are king. Um, <clears throat> but I, I get what he was saying in the sense that he was saying that that's, like it's, you know, it's quite a simple problem for a complex thing. Um, and he was saying that a lot of people, and, and I, I completely agree with this comment, um, a lot of people basically don't, they just can't track calories. Like some people can, and they'll, they'll get really good results. Um, you know, sort of for me, I, 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 when I've tracked calories previously, so an example that I've got was during the um, lockdown, when I was on furlough, so I was at home. So I, <clears throat> I was had the time to track my calories, yeah. like even down to I don't know I'd cook like a fried egg sandwich, and I'd I'd you know weigh out the butter, um, I'd obviously scan the bread, I'd weigh the bread on some occasions, got that deep into it, but I'd put some more oil in the pan, I'd make my egg, I'd weigh the oil going into the pan, so it was I don't know nine milliliters, cook my egg, and then I'd pour the oil back out, 
and go right now. There's, there's three or three <laughs> milliliters left, so I've used six milliliters. <laughs> no I went way. to those extremes, Fucking hell. Um, and I'd planned out. Um, so I've got a spreadsheet at home that I use where I can basically plan out someone's weight loss journey based on their calories, um, and it will adjust your calorie requirements depending on your body weight dropping. Um, which needs to obviously be a consideration. Um, <clears throat> and then you can put in, you know, you can undulate it. So if you know you've, you've got a stag deal or something coming up, then you can make sure that you're accounting for that. And basically you can go from, I don't know, day one to day 90. And you can see like where your calories, or where your weight's going to be if you stick to this regime. And I did that during lockdown. I did a couple of fasting days. How, ac all, how accurate was it? Mate, it was bang on. The It wasn't week by week. So there were weeks where I was off higher, lower. But by the end, I, I was within like a, a, a couple of, I, was, I think I was doing kilo. So I was like 0 0.2 kilos out from where I, where I started and where I ended, where I thought I would end. I was 0.2 kilos out from that point. Um, and, you know, I was, <clears throat> yeah, measuring everything. I was quite const uh, consistent with my exercise and my energy output. And for me, that, that proved to me that managing calories will work. But... It, it, like day to day I don't always have the time to do that and then what I do is I'll, I won't track certain things or um, <clears throat> or I'll track them incorrectly and then I find that it's a bit of a struggle mm. but I think the the point is though there's like 90% of people aren't going to do that and then the, the one thing I will say and it's not because I'm a PT but it's like get get a help, get help get a PT get a nutritionist get someone to help you give you a plan so you haven't got to fucking think about it you know, the the only thing you'll have to do, and you won't have to be as extreme as you where you're doing your oil and stuff, but they can just, as long as they've got a set of scales at home and they can weigh stuff out, they can get those results, you know? And that's that's my big thing with it. It's like, yeah, I understand what you're saying where people won't track calories correctly. But if you've got a professional there doing that for you, giving you exactly, you don't even have to think. You just go, right, okay, I'll follow this plan and it will get me. You trust that person, you know? to get you from here to here, you know, and it, and it does whack. It does whack. Yeah, no, it does. Um, and then I, I guess to, to kind of create a balanced view, view on this. So, so after speaking to Paris, um, I went away and kind of reflected on my own nutrition. Um, and I'd been sort of plateauing a little bit with my weight primarily because I'm super fucking busy. Got about three jobs on the go at the moment. Um, training around that, got a child as well. So it's, I'm busy and I just, I just wasn't tracking, mate. Um, I was struggling with it. And I casted my mind back to maybe, I don't know, where are we now? Maybe six years ago when I was, in my opinion, probably in the best shape that I'd ever been in. And thought about what I was eating then. And it, was, it wasn't it was a strict carnivore diet, but it was a very, very low carb diet. Um, you know, very, very animal based. Um, lots of dairy, lots of meat, eggs, everything else. And not only was I in a good, my, my physique, my, not only was my physique good then, but also just like injuries and how my body was feeling was good then as well. So I, I thought less about, I, I guess, the weight control. Um, I thought more about the inflammatory effect that Paris talked about, which is why he was so keen on it. Um, and I actually have, have adopted a very similar diet since that episode. So where are we now? About four, five, six weeks, maybe. Um, yeah, and, probably about six. I think. Yeah, and, and interesting, a couple of things I've noticed. Um, so the, the the first thing is part of the reason why I did it is I had a couple of injuries through like jujitsu. So I had a real hand problem. Um, I think I gripped a lapel um, or a collar, and someone ripped it off as they do and cracked my fingers. But I couldn't spread my fingers out like this. So like just like that was super painful. So I couldn't grip anything. Um, just moving it was really painful so there was that and also I had a real chronic like elbow problem so I think you've had that for ages yeah so yeah. I think it was my uh, tricep tendon uh, I think it was a tricep tendonopathy so tricep uh, tendon um, but then that was just causing other issues so I was getting a bit of um, golfer's elbow uh, so like sort of um, medial uh, epicondylitis um and just other bits just going on. And again, it was just like I couldn't base on it or anything. And, and since I've been, since I've changed my diet and taken carbs out pretty much entirely, so I still eat berries, um, <clears throat> you know, obviously you have carbs and things like milk and everything, but starchy carbs or so bread, rice, pasta, um, just haven't eaten any of it. And I've noticed a real improvement in those injuries, like much better, much better. It's um, weird, isn't it? And then the other thing I noticed as well, all my weights come down a little bit. Um, and I, I say it hasn't come out much. I said, well, it didn't come out much, but I guess it has because it's probably down about a kilo and a half, two kilos, and it's only been six weeks or so. So actually, there's quite a drop. We know that, 
you know, you'll, you'll see a kilo in water drop when you drop your cards yeah, away. Yeah, you know, straight away. Um, but I have noticed that my physique's changed. So I'm starting to see abs again, which I haven't seen for a while. It would have been good to have got you on, um, get, get, uh, to have got your body fat percentage when you had started. Because that's the big one, isn't it? I say to my clients a lot of times, like the scales, when you get to a certain point, the scales are not, they're important, but they're not the be and end all. You know, they're not, you know, if we're trying to lose fat sometimes, you know, when you, you, you gain a muscle, you're eating better, you know, all these different variables. Really, the, the key is, who gives a fuck what weight you are if you've got 10% body fat? Yeah. <laughs> do you yeah. know what I mean? No one gives a fuck, do they? You yeah, so, so there's definitely been a change in body composition yeah. and, and I can see that clearly in the mirror. I can feel it in my clothes, so I'm really pleased about that. Um, but the other thing I noticed as well, and this, this, this was interesting to one of Paris's points, because he said to you, I think, why don't I put on fat? Uh, it's because I'm a fat burner. And he said, I can eat, you know, as many calories as I want from fat and I won't put on weight. He then went on to say that I haven't eaten today and some days I don't eat at all. So yeah. back to the calories. Calories, thing. yeah. And one thing that I found is that my my appetite is really downregulated since I've removed carbs. And I've also found that there's some days where I've got to 5 p.m. and I'm like, I've not even eaten today. And, and you feel fine? I feel all right, yeah. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so, I, I get to like, I don't eat breakfast, like I said, and my first meal is at one. And by the time I get to one, I'm fucking starving. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, Phew. yeah. So, so yeah, appetite wise, like it's really down regulated. So, so I'm still convinced that although, you know, maybe I'm a, you know, a fat burner now and my body's, you know, more efficient at using my own body fat to create energy. Um, I, I'm still convinced that I'm in a calorie deficit. Do you know what would be interesting is, is if you went and got your body fat percentage checked, um, next time we do one of these episodes in another, I don't know, six, 10, 12 weeks, whatever it is. Um, but then also tracking your calories on what you're eating loosely, even if you've done it loosely yeah. to see if you are constantly in a, in a deficit or you're in a surplus, yeah. because effectively, if you are in a deficit, you're in a deficit because you're just cutting out foods mm. rather than it being because you're eating this, yeah. you know, that's the thing you're limiting all the high calorie foods, yeah. you know, and like you said, bread, cakes, pies, pasties, sausage rolls, all the things that people are just fucking nightmares for. You're just effectively cutting it all out. You're eating very healthily. You know, you're eating really good lean meats, you know, eggs, dairy, whatever. But you're never going to sit there and eat fucking 20 eggs, uh, which is, uh, you know, if you're going to eat a big brownie, <laughs> that's effectively, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not going to, you're not going to have the same impact on your body. So sugar. Yeah, I had a, um, I had, I, I, I made uh, some scrambled eggs, <clears throat> six eggs, um, put some chorizo in there. Yeah. I think a bit of like feta cheese, but fucking hell, mate, it was, I could barely eat it. It was so filling, it was yeah. so satiating. I was like, fucking hell, I, I couldn't eat this. And then once I let that, I was like, don't eat again for ages. But like you say, if smashing a brownie, mate, I could- Well, that's what I was about to say, yeah. You could, you could eat that. And then if there was a brownie next to you about an hour later, you would go, oh, you know what? I could, I, could, I could still, I could find room for a brownie, but you're not going to find room for a bit of steak because you're like, fuck it, I've just had that. Yeah, you know? and, and it's, yeah, uh, like you said about the other stuff as well, you know, you're cutting out a whole food group and- And it's such a big food group. And, you know, example, I went, to, uh, I went to Pennywell Farm with Archer yeah. and I was there and genuinely the only food you could buy was beige. Like that was it. Like I, I couldn't eat. I was, I was there, I, was, I literally couldn't, can't eat any of this. Whereas normally, if I was like an unrestricted diet, I'd go, I mean, I'm a bit peckish, oh, i fuck it, I'll have a pasty. Or, you know, or any of the other beige things they were adding off, which all have got a minimum of probably 600 calories in them. So, so for me, it, it, you know, it, it does work, but I think, you know, as much as, you know, you, you obviously draw your energy uh, through somewhere else, which is often wrapped around your body, I still think ultimately it comes down to that energy balance. Um, I think it know. definitely does. I think if you was eating 5,000 calories a day, consistently every single day of fats, meats, you know, eggs, you'd put on weight. I'm, I'm, I'm so adamant on that. That's where, that's where, you know, that's where I draw the line really on, on, on the, on the subject. Yeah, I'm you know? with you. I'm with you on that mate. And, but the reality is on that sort of diet, you never, you're not going to, you're not going to. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. So, um, but, but I think just to, to kind of close out on that episode, I think the one bit of advice that I'd say to people is it's like anything. It's like a good rehab program. I can remember when I was at uni, they said, you know, what, what's the best sort of rehab program? One answer for every time, the one someone fucking sticks to the one that someone adheres to. So, it can be as fancy as is science backed as you want. If someone doesn't adhere to a rehab program, it's not going to fucking work. And I think diet's the same. So whether it's carnival diet, 
tracking, if it fits your macros, veganism. If you can stick to it and it puts you in a deficit, then great. It's going to work. But if it doesn't, well, if you can track calories and try fucking being a carnivore, you know, if you don't want to eat meat, be a vegan, whatever. But, you know, there's, you've just got to find what works for you as an individual. Yeah, and I think I'd, that's ultimately it. I'd love to get a, a science-based vegan on here to talk about, you know, their views on stuff. Yeah. Just, just as a complete contrast in view. Yeah. I'd love that. You know, any, any out there, reach out because I'd love to get you on, like <laughs> legitimately. <laughs> and just, uh, and just, uh, you know, as long as you're not going to be talking about game changes on Netflix, then we'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, you can reach out to that, <laughs> shall we? Oh, what's, what's he called? Yeah, he's, he's, right. he's, he's into his martial arts and stuff yeah, as well, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. in the UFC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, bit, a bit of an icon, wasn't he? Yeah, so that's not pulled out with him. There's two yeah. of us and then we'll be all right. Yeah, we'll be all right. Remember, <laughs> two straight white belt, we? That's it, mate. <laughs> cool. So uh, moving on then. So we uh, got, we're up to episode 18. Uh, so this was with Steve. So how BJJ martial arts helped... Um, Steve, who's a, a six dan karateka uh, with his PTSD following the, the, the sad death of his daughter. Um, we obviously know Steve Percy, really great guy. Um, obviously an absolute like OG of, of martial arts and, you know, karate, m despite the fact about all like humble he is. Yeah, and I'd emphasize what an odd bastard he yeah. is as well. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Hit replacement and all. <laughs> He's hell. an horrible git. Yeah. In, in the nicest possible way. But yeah, obviously very accomplished uh, martial artist, um, you know, sort of has, has won world titles in, in karate, uh, but so fucking humble, just doesn't like to talk about it, but um, very well respected, I think, in the karate community. Um, and, you know, a great jujitsu guy now as well. You know, he, he, he dedicates his life to martial arts um, and it really shows in his in his mindset and his ability. And as we just said, you know, injuries, old age aside, you know, for a 90 year old, he's lethal. Yeah, he's doing all right. Yeah. But obviously really sad story. And um, I thought like, fucking hell, hats off to him for how candid he was about that because it, it, you could tell in his demeanor, I thought, when we got onto that topic, how, how hard it still is for him to talk about that. Yeah, I don't think you ever get over it or you, I, I can't you, you can't imagine you, it, you couldn't could no, you, you could never even me. especially because it's, it's you know he's had children before that and it happened you know what i mean and, and you know i think once you experience having children and what they really mean to you you know it's 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 such a you know that that feeling that you have and you know what that that feeling will you're going to have for that baby you know and yeah. experiencing that and what they grow up like and whatever else and to have that taken away from you it's just it's unimaginable and um for him to say like you know you know with jiu-jitsu and and his and his martial arts to, to really help his head you know i think that was such a big message for people out there who are struggling with all sorts of different types of things you know especially men you know going out and just <laughs> saying shit but like just fucking fighting and getting some of that aggression out and not having any thought on the shit outside you know and I talk about it all the time but if you're on the match you can't think of anything else you can't think of anything else and it is just a complete break from the world and whether you're good <laughs> or shit it doesn't really matter you know it doesn't really matter because you will get better progressively but it's not even about that it's not even about that it's just about that sort of exertion of energy and just getting chinned really yeah no you're, you're spot on mate but yeah going back to obviously the you know the the actual you know, loss that he suffered. And I think obviously PTSD, it's, you know, you hear about it a lot from the lads coming back from tour in the military, but you almost forget sometimes, or I, or I certainly did that. Normal everyday people who have suffered trauma yeah. can, can also get post-traumatic stress disorders. You know what I mean? So it can apply to anybody. And and some of the, the, the symptoms that he talked about as well were so sad where, you know, he'd, he'd obviously lost his, his daughter on, you know, on that occasion. But he had some other children that were a bit older and grown up, but he'd lost some of the memories. So in part, I'd lost oh no, some that of that horrible, as well. Wasn't it? So horrible. it has a wider impact than just that. That you know, and it was it sticks person. in my head as well about the library with his brain, yeah. where he's got the information there, but it takes him a second to rec uh, rec recollect it. You know, yeah. to to get it back in and and to find where exactly where it is and yeah. stuff like that. So interesting. The mind is fascinating, isn't it? How it works and how it compartmentalizes different parts and yeah. you know just crazy yeah and, and i think just just on that as well because i think we had a comment where someone was talking about obviously the medication and, and, and everything else because we kind of touched on obviously sort of antidepressants and you know we've kind of have had various experts and, and, and medical professionals on and talking about that and they obviously i, I guess what i want to say is obviously with a complex mental health condition you know, you absolutely should seek professional support 
you know, from a health professional. Um, but what we're saying, we're not saying stop your medication and just do jujitsu. We're saying, you know, there, there's more available than just medication. That's, that's the point. So, you know, if you do have a complex medical condition or mental health condition, definitely go to your GP, definitely seek professional help. But in addition to that, what else can you do? What else can you take, be accountable for? And that's where we talk about, you know, are you drinking? Let's stop that. You know, that's a, is your diet shit. Let's clean that up. You know, are you getting around, you know, good people, you know, create a good network. Are you being physically active? Yeah. You know, that's kill a few birds with one stone and go fucking jujitsu then. You know what I mean? Because you're around good people. Like you say, you're switching your head off. You know, you're allowing, you, you, you're being allowed to, to be aggressive, you know, and get some of those frustrations out in a really controlled, constructive way. Um, you know, and you build great relationships as a result and you get camaraderie and trust with people and you start opening up and talking about things. So that's what we're saying, just to clear up anybody who makes Yeah, it's, it's not that we're saying not to use antidepressants. You know, if they're needed, they're needed. But I think they should, we should, you should always look at, you know, every other aspect of your life, like what Paul just said, every other aspect of your life and making sure that's the, like, that's not causing your issue, you know, before then you're going on to medication or, you know, you can use it in conjunction. You can use both, you know, you can go on these medications and then look at all the other aspects of your life while you're feeling better on these medications, because they do give you, you know, a sense of well-being. you know, they do give you that. So then while you're feeling like that, then maybe you can look at all the different aspects, yeah. you know? And, and I, 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 I can't remember who said this, but um, <clears throat> it's like that, it's, it's, you know, antidepressants aren't a silver bullet. You know what I mean? It, it will, will help put you in, in a slightly better headspace. But if your situation remains the same, yeah. then, you know, is the root problem ever going to be fixed? Be fixed yeah. so, so it's just thinking about that. So, so that was it. But yeah, going back to the, uh, the jujitsu thing and how our martial arts help, I think <laughs> we've said it so many times and we'll probably continue to say it, but... You know, it has so many benefits. Um, and if it's not martial arts, you know, like CrossFit, you know, we'll, we'll come on to, to obviously Bish's episode in a bit. Um, you know, or competitive tennis, like Will, or whatever, whatever it is, but just being physically active, you know, sort of being slightly competitive, being around like-minded people. Um, and that that's the key thing. But yeah, love love that episode. You know, we've got a lot of time for Steve, absolute legend. So, uh, so yeah, awesome. All right, next episode. So episode 19. So this was um, really cool. So we were fortunate enough to uh, be joined by Mike Rundy, who's obviously a uh, UFC vet, um, you know, sort of a pioneer of, of British wrestling, um, sort of Commonwealth game medalist. Um, had an amazing MMA record, a really big prospect going into the UFC. Um and just had so much fucking like just it just seems to me like he was fucking super unlucky. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm not saying like not making excuses for him, but you look at going into it and you know, the things that he said that was going on around at the time and, and fair play to him, he doesn't make any excuses, but his dad being ill and, and all that type of stuff's never fucking easy, is it? And then you look at it and you think just a couple of decisions, a couple of things that could have went the other way and he could still be there. Yeah. And uh I think he's doing the right thing not retiring. Yeah. So I think he should definitely have another crack at it. Yeah. You know, just just you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I think he'll kick himself because he's long time retired, isn't you? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent, mate. And um, yeah, I mean, he's he's still in great nick as well. We did uh, obviously the wrestling seminar afterwards. Yeah, well, you couldn't make it sadly, but you were you were there watching. And yeah, I mean, he got hold of me a couple of times. We weren't we weren't sparring as such, but even just demoing, mate, just his ability to kind of move you. You know, he's obviously in great shape and. You know the the, the, the so even in the warm ups of the shit he was doing on his head with his neck, some of those uh, you know sort of old wrestling drills. You know he's he's you know as he said he kept himself in great nick and it'd be amazing to see him back back in the octagon, whether it's a UFC one or any. But yeah, I think he's still got a lot of um, yeah, I think he's still got some uh, yeah, I think he's still got some way to go before he should retire for sure. Um, yeah, I just think yeah, I just think he's got so much to offer, <laughs> and like you know you look at he's a super nice guy as well, isn't he? You know what I mean? Like really nice guy, you know. And um, I just think, I just think with all his knowledge, like when we, when he was talking about you know what he's done in, in wrestling and 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 being a wrestler is such an advantage in MMA, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Such an advantage. Like if you can, if you're a good wrestler, like and he's the fucking best. You know what I mean? He's the best in the UK. You know, and like you said, he's been a pioneer for it. So he should, he should, yeah, just fucking smash it out. And yeah, but it was it was cool like hearing because I think. You know, it's almost like Gary's episode, isn't it? Where you've got a professional athlete, 
you know, and although he wasn't a premiership player, you know, he played at a championship level, which is still yeah, very, 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 very good. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 and it's, you know, both of them, there was like a theme I thought with that, where they obviously both started relatively young, both were very passionate about what they were doing, but just kept turning up. You know what I mean? Just were, were consistent. Um, and that's what I really enjoyed about Mike's episode when he was just talking about obviously the you know his early career and just that he just stayed on it was always training. The the only difference I'd say between being a footballer and you know any of us can't maybe kind of sportsman yeah. trying to make it is the money. When Mike was talking about you know he was training and he had no money he's trying to support a kid trying to do all this that there is so fucking hard and I imagine there must be so many talented people that just slip through the nets yeah. because of financial region, reasons. They end up going into whatever, you know? They end up going just even being a brickie or a fucking plumber or whatever because they just can't afford to keep doing what they're good at. And fair play to Mike because he just fucking stuck with it. You know, he stuck with it and he, he just pursued his dream. And, you know, I think, I think listening to that, more people, you know, it, Ricky talks about it as well. You know, he just fucking goes for it you know he's he just sacked most of our aspects of his life off to really follow that dream and like you said if you really are dedicated and you really want something and you've got that bit of talent behind you or even that bit of grit sometimes it may not even be talent it might be just that grit or determination i think you can achieve what you want if you was to go right okay this is what i want to achieve and it's realistic yeah, no, I think you're right, man. That applies not just to, to sport, but I think a lot of things, mate. If you if you genuinely get up every day and try your hardest and you do that consistently for years and years and years. You will get there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's like we talk about with this, isn't it? You know, I mean, we're no fucking, we haven't got, we're not coming into this, you know, with any sort of record, you know, any sort of brand behind us. We're, we're you know, complete newbies to this. And we're not the best interviewers in the world and we're, you know, don't have access to the best guests in the world. But we plan just to stay on it and stay consistent. And uh, it'd be interesting to see, like, when we're doing this same conversation in a year's time and see where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly we'll that, mate. We'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But you never know. So, yeah, that was cool. But it'd be enjoying my mic. And, yeah, he's, he's just, yeah, as you say, super nice guy. Really humble. Um, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely pleasure. I want to go up there. Yeah. I do. I want to go up there. I want to yeah. go up there and see what it's all about. Yeah. And he, he talked a little bit about his... Um, about his actual facility that he's got in Wigan. Oh, man, that sounds incredible, amazing. doesn't it? Yeah, but it, it looks it looks sick and, and looks yeah it looks really cool. Got all the all the gear. But the other thing that he kind of touched on very early in the beginning, we didn't talk much about, is he's got that online academy as well. Yeah, and yeah, and, and yeah, the Mike Grundy thing. Yeah, and I think people should definitely check that out. If you go back to the episode, the links in the description. Um, have a little look at that. It's not particularly expensive at the moment. I, I had a look. It's, it looks really good. Yeah, yeah, it looks really, really good. Like yeah. it's got everything. It's got yeah. everything. He's just done instructions for everything. Yeah. So I think yeah, go check that out, and um, yeah, you'll probably learn a lot. Um, and then we continued our string of uh, fighters or, or martial artists, and we had our man uh, Miko from Chokes and More, <laughs> episode twenty, um, our first road trip as well. Yeah, it's good. Um, and obviously, we, we titled that one Chokes and More, um, which obviously is his Instagram handle. Um, he's also known as Miko uh, BJJ slash Tattoo Addict on Facebook as well. But yeah, super big following, big personality. Um, but yeah, I'm fucking we, good at jiu-jitsu, by the way. Yeah. Um, he's legit. <laughs> yeah, since, since obviously got his black belt. Yeah, um, yeah, he goes back so Miko, Congratulations, my man. Well deserved. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was cool because we were talking about his jiu-jitsu journey. Um and, uh, you know, it's, he's been at it for 11 years, which, you know, sat here now isn't, you know, as long as me, perhaps. But <laughs> like we talked about, he's been consistent yeah. and he fucking, you know, he teaches 20, 30 hours a week doing yeah, that for that amount of time. It? You know, he's dedicated yeah. his life to it for that amount of time. So. But he's getting those rewards now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's got his black belt. He's in such a fucking good position yeah. now. You know what I mean? And the thing that people have asked me of, about what's he like to roll with and stuff like that, you know, and we were lucky enough to, to have a bit of time, done a class with him and then had a bit of, bit of extra time just to roll with him and stuff. And um, I think we would both say that, you know, his, his, his jokes are legit. <laughs> you know, it's not, there's no fluff to it. You know, there's, you know, he gets you in something and it, it's the le little details, isn't it? It's the little details that, you know, he, he, he caught, he caught you with some crazy stuff out of nowhere, you know, and it's like, yeah. it's, 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 it works. Yeah. And that's it. It's, um, you know, a lot of his, a lot of his stuff, it, he catches you in transitions, yeah. which you don't get caught with. And it's one of those things that, you know, you could argue if you train with him enough, 
like you'd once or twice you'd catch you, then you'd figure it stuff out. But it's like we talked about, it's similar to Steve, who we just obviously had a chat about, that nimble style of jiu-jitsu is a fucking pain in the ass because it... You're never safe. Yeah, so you're always second guessing, you know, where you're putting stuff. And it, it, at the very least, it like nullifies your game a little bit because you're worried about where you're putting grips, where you're putting your hands, your feet. Your feet, yeah. Your feet's a big one, mate. When you take someone's back, I know, I know Steve does it to me all the time. He's trying to like rip my foot up and, and toe hold me or some some shit. And I'm like, fuck, you know, like, you know. <laughs> and you are though. It, it's like, and then it makes you stop worrying about your fundamental, your, you know, your grip, your this, because you're worried about him ripping your fucking foot off every two seconds, you know? Yeah, but um, on that as well, and I think this is something that people will question because with that sort of style you're always doing, I, I did in fairness, but it's obviously his fundamentals. Um, but certainly rolling with him and chatting to him, you know, it, it, as far as I can see, his fundamentals are fucking solid as well. Well, I think that's it. I think from his journey and what he was saying is his fundamentals, you know, were good. And then he's added this into it. Yeah. So I think that's the best way to do it. You know, you can, it's no point someone like me whose fundamentals are not great going and trying to do all this stupid shit. You know, you need to get those fundamentals right. Especially, you know, speaking to Kenny and, and, and all the people at Flow and some of the good guys, you know, I look at the, the, the top guys even at Flow, their fundamentals are so good. And if their fundamentals are so good, it makes it so fucking hard to roll with. You know what I mean? Because it just, just nullifies so much of your game. Yeah, no, it, it does, mate. And um, I think he said he, he got to pretty much purple belt um, before he started playing with all that stuff. And... You know, as, as he said, he was white belt for three and a half years for opening his mouth, um, <laughs> which is funny as well. <laughs> yeah, but not surprising at all. No, no. jiu jitsu and, and jiu jitsu professors. Um, and I think he was on the blue belt for a little while as well because that's when he changed clubs. So he, um, I think he was on that for a, a, maybe two or three years. So he, he had, you know, some, he had a good innings. Yeah, he but fucking probably about six, up. six, seven years yeah. before he was a purple belt, you know? Yeah. So that's a, that's a fucking long time, especially with how consistent he was, yeah. you know? I, I don't know if he said it on the podcast or off the podcast, but I know he said that he was like living really cheap for years yeah. and just kind of like, you know, getting by so that he could just do jujitsu full time because he had this goal of being... Something. something in jiu-jitsu he didn't even know what you know but just had me either being a coach or a competitor or whatever it was going to be you know it's, it's, it's fucking cool isn't it? yeah but um yeah super cool guy but also massive shout out to uh to, to dave jones and the guys down at kind of resilience hub as well yeah because they were um it was our first road trip um so we we, we try and get people in the studio if we can but we we felt for for Mika it was worth the trip so we we went down to those guys but they were super accommodating um yeah, just looked after us for the whole day. Gave, yeah, gave so, us. such a nice guy, wasn't he, Dave? Like, yeah. Super nice. Like, you know, it's it's rare you find people like that. You know, it's like, you know, he just let us use his facility and come and record and, and didn't want anything back, you know, and he didn't ask for anything back. He didn't ask for any, you know, or, you know, like put me in, put me in the video or, any, you know, all the stuff that we put in the background was us saying, like, should we put something in the background? It wasn't him, was it? You know, and it's was, it was really refreshing, actually. You know, just having someone who just wanted to be a nice guy and just to help and you know do those types of things you know yeah no a really interesting guy and he, he's got a fascinating story himself and he's, he's doing some amazing things hence why Mika was over so we're we're going to hopefully get him on the podcast at some point yeah. um, you know probably in a few weeks a uh, month or so's time once we're excited to see what that Miko Dave partnership yeah. is because they, they're wouldn't, they're they wouldn't even tell us they're off air something. yeah they wouldn't tell us even like off air you yeah. know what i mean like so yeah so it's, it's fascinating and if you uh yeah i mean if it, it's a funny spot because there's not much going on in red roof but if you're ever in cornwall when you're around red roof way um it's not too far from places like new key but yeah drop in and, and check out um the resilience hub there they're, they're building like a really amazing facility and yeah great and, building isn't it yeah and they've Coming got some down. really cool stuff there flotation tank which yeah. sadly, i didn't get a go in <laughs> well, well I, th I think we should go back down yeah he, he's offered us back down hasn't yeah. he and said we could we could pop down anytime yeah so, so yeah super super down. cool guys down there but very friendly very friendly bunch and, and good guys to train with so yeah get down there uh right so uh who we got next so we then had wayne uh wayne child from gym bubbers yeah. um so obviously talking about um, you know his his upbringing, which was was a little bit checkered, um, and then obviously went on to to kind of avoid that path, and you know sort of open, you know a small business um, which specialises in, in kids gymnastics. Um, the the work they do I know quite well, and it's it's amazing. Um, and obviously then went through that turbulent time that so many small businesses did, which was obviously COVID, which which you were obviously wrapped up in as well. So. So it was interesting to hear his story and um, 
yeah, I think Wayne bless him. I think he, he there's a lot more he probably could have said, but you know, he was mindful of the sort of business he's in and, you know, didn't want to say too much, but yeah, fascinating story, I think. And, and I always love hearing those stories because we've talked about before the fact that we're, you know, both from council estates and there's so many people out there on the internet that, you know, had privileged backgrounds and but mine was by no means fucking bad. Don't get me wrong. It was relatively privileged, but you know, it wasn't, it still wasn't, it was, a, you know, it was difficult. And I think for Wayne, obviously his dad being a, you know, a career criminal, quite <laughs> yeah. young, not having the best relationship with his mum, um, you know, he could have very easily gone down the wrong path. And I think it's always great to hear people that are kind of moving in that direction and, and somehow, you know, have like a, a key moment where they do a bit of a U-turn um, and then use that. I really like the fact when he said that, obviously during the pandemic, during various other things that have happened in the business, that stuff that happened kind of almost prepared him for those challenges. And I always love hearing stories like that. Yeah, no, that, it, his story was, <laughs> it was so interesting, wasn't it? Especially with the stuff with his mum and that. I, I was like, that's fucking crazy. But out of all of it, something really good to come out of it. Yeah. You know, Jim Bubba's is an amazing business. Does so well and it's it's needed because there's so many kids that are just not only overweight, but they just, you know, no flexibility. You know, they, they don't know how to move. It, if, you, if you're starting your child young on something like that, it's always going to benefit them later on. You know, it's always going to stay with them. I think of uh, Zach, who I train with quite a lot, and he'd done gymnastics at a young age. He's gone into jujitsu and MMA now. And you, big shout out to Zach. He just won his first MMA fight. Uh, no, uh, K1. Yeah, yeah, he won it last weekend. Yeah, yeah he done really well. But he, um, but you can see in his movement, the way he moves, you can see his, his background is, is gymnastics. You know, he's, he's just so in tune with his body. And it will, it will help him through throughout his journey and other things. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And um, <clears throat> you'll find this as well being a PT. Um, but like when I've trained people, you can tell like people that moved or did, not even just did sport, but people that, and, and Kenny talked about it like, literally way back when, when we did the episode with him, how if people have done any sort of sport, they're, they're just their understanding of balance and movement mm-hmm. and their ability to transfer, you know, sort of physically to different things is so much better. And I think getting kids into that so young, you know, especially this day and age when, like he was saying, it's okay not to be a TikTok video. You can just be a kid and move. But, you know, kids can't, you know, they can't move their bodies correctly. They can't jump, you know, their balance or coordination, you know, all that stuff for a lot of kids these days with the way we live is, is so poor compared to, to, you know, how we were designed and what we're capable of. I think, yeah, as you say, that type of start for, for kids is great. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. Mate. So, yeah, so amazing good, work. Yeah. Uh, and then we had um, episode 22. So we obviously had Craig Harrison on from Andy's Man Club. Um, so they were, uh, yeah, obviously a, a sort of UK-based charity for those, you know, maybe in the States and outside the UK. Um, talking men's group. Um, we were tr- we, we'd been trying to get them on for a while, actually, because we were very aware of them. And we've had their, their website information in our descriptions pretty much since the time we started. Yeah, I think we have, haven't we? Um, and yeah, it was... It was it was a weird episode, wasn't it? I mean, in the sense of how it made us feel, I think. Afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I, I went home and I was just like, it's a good episode, really good episode. But at the same time, it's fucking depressing, isn't it? Because the state of what society has got men into at times is, is just scary, you know? The statistics behind it and things like that, you know? I couldn't believe that more blokes kill themselves than any sort of disease or you know, between certain ages and... Just, yeah, yeah, so for those that maybe haven't watched the episode yet, again, check it out. But um, yeah, some of the stats that we talked through. So uh, in the UK, you asked about America, actually, I didn't look it up in the end, but we should do. Um, but in the UK, at least, uh, yeah, death by suicide is, is the biggest killer of men under 50, um, which is insane. Um, even even in, in sort of teenagers and children, so those sort of 19 and younger, it's the second biggest killer. Yeah, it's, um, it's it. yeah, and I think I can't remember the total number, but it, it breaks down to twelve people a day or twelve men a day commit suicide or, or die by suicide, um, and that's like two per hour. So again, in this conversation, there's probably a guy somewhere that's yeah, yeah, which is a really sad, sad state. And you know, we we talk a lot on this podcast about um, you know leveling guys up. You know, our purpose is to to try and inspire men to maybe to take a little bit of accountability and, you know, learn some new skills, you know, sort of maybe get better people around them, get a handle of their finances, 
do more exercise, stop drinking, all this stuff. And we try and bring on experts that can facilitate that with good quality information. But I think when we had Craig on, it highlighted the fact that, you know, there is still very much a place for men just to talk. And there is that stigma around guys not talking. Um, you know, and men should definitely talk. And I think when men get together in that group and they create their brotherhood, I think it's so much easier to talk. And I think the reaction that you often get was, is, is far more powerful as well. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. It's, there's, there's, for me, it's not much to say on the episode because you've got to go and watch it and go and listen to what Craig's been through and what you know his, his experiences are because it's hard for me to talk about it because I don't really experience it. And you know I might one day, but I think doing the job I do and speaking to the people I do keeps me very very grounded in, in the warning signs of things. So I try and act on stuff. If I'm feeling a bit meh, I'll, I'll try and act on it quick because I, I see those warning signs and I see the things that are around me that are pissing me off. And then I try and fucking get rid of those things that are pissing me off pretty quick. But again, not everyone's able to do that or not everyone's able to see that. Um, but yeah, I think just go and watch the episode, listen to the episode, whichever way you want to do it. And um, if you are feeling low, go and go and go to an Andy's Man Club. You know they're trying to roll them out everywhere. They're, they're within a twenty-minute drive of everywhere in the country. I think they're trying to, trying yes, to aim for something yeah, like that. Which yeah, so um, so yeah, every every Monday seven to nine, um, they run a, they run a men's only sort of talking group. And um, yeah, again, go watch the episode, but they essentially facilitate conversation in those meetings and they have three standard questions, um, you know, which is, you know, I think I can't, re I can't remember exactly what they were. Um, so sort of like, how is your, how's your week been? How's your week been? I think, you know, what good thing has happened this week, you know, and, and, and kind of what's going on. And then, you know, that's fairly standard every single week. And then they ask two questions each week that are kind of variable, but anywhere you go in the country, any club will ask the same questions. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, they're most of the guys that I think all of the guys that facilitate and they're involved working have, have, have been there, you know, so they, they, they know, you know, how, know how it feels and they appreciate that everybody, you know, it's not, you know, it's not whose problem is worse. It's everyone's got their own shit going on. And to them, it's the, you know, it's the biggest thing going on and they respect that. And there's no obligation to talk. You don't need to be referred. So I think, yeah, watch the episode because Craig's very kind in sharing his own story. And it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, a relationship breakdown, you know, I mean, it's not, it's, it's something that happens to so many guys, but because he was isolated, you know, it had a real profound impact on his mental health and by, you know, finding a group to talk to about it. But didn't, didn't he say that he found that most blokes are going to those Andy's man club through relationship breakdowns, not having anywhere to live, not seeing their children, you know, all those really valid fucking reasons. But, you know, that's one of the biggest causes of men being in, in those clubs. And, yeah, and yeah. It's, it certainly wasn't like, you know, like mad, tragic things happening. It was everyday shit, like, you know, struggling at work, struggling with money, splitting up with your missus, not being able to see your kids. It was those sort of things that, that, that were men were really struggling with. And I think that does fuck your head up more than anything, you know? It does, doesn't it? It, it does, it, it affects you more than you probably would like to admit or even think. Yeah, I think certainly the, um, yeah, I think where kids are involved as well, um, certainly in the UK, the, the kind of uh, family, you know, sort of justice system is, is very biased towards women. Um, you know, not one that we'll get into too much now, but it, it is very difficult when men, you know, good fathers, you know, are kind of ripped from their kids. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think for a lot of guys that that's literally horrendous because, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen to us? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think it's not. There's not much else you could really do to affect me other than, other than Kirsty and Jack. And you know, not seeing Jack would be <laughs> unimaginable. To be honest, yeah, it's horrendous, mate. So, um, so yeah, I mean, take our advice in regard to the things that we suggest around exercise and nutrition and everything else. But if you need a chat, go and check those guys out. Watch the episode. Links in the description. Um, but yeah, talking's good, fellas. So yeah. Don't be, uh, don't be shy from it. You won't be judged. Uh, and then finally, the last episode that we did was uh, with James Bish um, of CrossFit Plymouth. Um, so that was a cool episode. And I guess I, 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 I kind of titled it um, The CrossFit Training Method or How the CrossFit Training Method Transfers to Sport and Life. Because um, yeah, I thought we did a really good episode of, of saying it's a sport 
and it's also a training methodology as well yeah. and I thought that was really interesting and it was great to get Bish on because he's a bit of an OG he was one of the early adopters of uh, CrossFit in the UK I think one of the first 20 boxes in the 20, UK yeah, yeah. So, uh, so got on it really early um, really knowledgeable guy and it was great because with a, with a couple of different guests where we've talked about jujitsu and the benefits of you know, obviously the, phys the physical element, but also the community, the camaraderie, the lifestyle. CrossFit's come up a couple of times. It's so similar. Yeah. So similar. It's just a different acquisition. You know, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's virtually the same thing. Even the way the community feels and, you know, the adversity you go through and all those, because those fucking workouts, mate, are, are super hard. There's no two ways about it. Even if you're going in and doing, you know, like you said, they had tears and stuff like that. But, you know, it's it's only relevant to your fitness level. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's no easier for the the person that's going in at a low level because that's their level. So they're still working as hard as the super fit guy with a six pack doing that at this level. You know, so it's never you know it never really is you know too easy. Yeah, and it sounds like a little bit as well. They're um, you know again similar to jujitsu where you have your hobbyists and you have your competitors, and and they're almost two different things entirely and he obviously said that they're getting away from the scoreboards and, and stuff a little bit because they want to try and encourage you know sort of hobbyists and and people that are trying to come in for for sort of you know health and well-being benefits as well and i, I like the episode because i i've always liked crossfit you know i, I love like the, the 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 film about the crossfit games they've done some cool ones yeah it? it looks amazing and you know because i've always done martial arts that was enough toll on my body you know, I didn't want to do both. But actually, you know, hearing him talk, it sounds like maybe CrossFit could have complemented martial arts over the years. And also coming from, uh, you know, I guess a rehab, exercise rehab background, I've definitely been one of those sort of eyebrow raisers when it comes to CrossFit. Oh, yeah. Gonna go get I, think it's just the, I think it's just that at times CrossFit got the bad rep from the early stuff. Yeah. The early stuff when CrossFit was first coming through and, you know, you're seeing people doing these fucking weird kipping pull-ups and falling on the fucking head with barbells with poor technique. You know, the the early CrossFit game videos, you know, some of the technique was fucking shocking, you know? They were just rushing reps, not doing it properly, blah, blah, blah. but it's it's evolved so much since then. Like, you know, and, and like Bish, Bish even said, the only thing that they, they really got to worry about with the CrossFit is the technique when fatigued with so many people in the room. So it's having enough coaches to be able to check that there's, and as long as they're doing that and they're being safe with it, then yeah, CrossFit's fantastic, you know, but again, it's not for everyone. Um, but again, that's like everything, uh, you know, it's not for everyone, but it's, it's jujitsu is not for everyone or football's not for everyone or whatever it's, it's, but it's got definitely got its place. And what I quite like about CrossFit is if I was to move away on my own and I had nothing and I lived in a flat by myself saying I had my job, and I didn't have any friends. The first two things I'd do, I'd either join a CrossFit box or I'd join a Jiu Jitsu gym. Yeah. Because straight away you'd make friends. Yeah. You know, straight away. You could, you could go to Australia. That's the first thing I would do. If I went to Australia with Kirsty and Jack, go there, I'd find a good Jiu Jitsu gym and I'd probably join a CrossFit box as well to do my fitness. Mm -hmm. Because then it would, <laughs> two communities of friends that you'd instantly build. And forget the fitness and all the other side. That's really important for a lot of people because we forget, because we're from Plymouth, we live in Plymouth and, you know, we've grew up here. But there's a lot of people that move around a lot. You know, you, you talk about um, Luke on Andy's Man's Club and, and I'm like, what's it? Craig. Craig. That's Luke's the owner. He? <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, he was really isolated. Now, maybe if he did have, at that time, if he did have a CrossFit as a hobby or a jiu-jitsu gym or something, he may not have felt as isolated at that point. Not saying he still wouldn't have gone through what he went through. Of course he would. But, but he would have had some friends. But he found that community in Andy's Man Club. Exactly. It's the same yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know I mean? but, but he was he was lucky enough to have stumbled across, that, across Andy's Man Club. You know what I mean? But at another time, you may not have. You know? And uh, those sorts of communities are rare because there's not, there's not a lot of them. You know, there's not a lot of them where you can kind of go into any CrossFit box in the country. And if you do CrossFit, even at a low level, you can go there and still have like a fucking great time. And then you go through that stuff together and it's instant. It's weird. It's like an instant thing. You do CrossFit together. So you're instantly clucking mates. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You do jujitsu and, and you could, you know, there's a guy the other day who comes to the gym for the first time and he's a nice lad and just rolling with him for like five minutes. He was chatting to him after and whatever. And, you know, you yeah. just feel, you feel that kinship. Yeah, itself. mate, it's, it's fucking remarkable for, for people that haven't experienced this and, I, and, and, and I don't know if it's if it's a, a gender thing. I don't know if it's like male or female, but 
I can only speak obviously from a from a male perspective. But yeah, if if you're a lad or a bloke and you you've not like you've not done phys- if you've not done exercise with other guys, you have gotta fucking give it a go because like you say, it is it's it's unbelievable like the. The the, the 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 friendship and the camaraderie that you build as a result of that shared physical struggle it's amazing and I would say it's different as well to football and the only I, don't, I can't explain it football's a team sport and you become very friendly with your teammates because you spend a lot of time with them but it's not the same integration as is what you get with uh, a, a CrossFit community or a, a Jiu Jitsu gym and I I don't really know why. Um, and what I mean by that is you have your teammates and you become really close with your teammates, but your teammates move, people drop, people come in and out. And um, you don't say you play against the other team. So say you're, you know, playing a local team and you're playing the same people all the time. You know each other, but you're not really friendly. It's quite it's quite a different feeling to, to what you get in a CrossFit gym. But I don't know if it's because of the adversity and because it's fucking hard, you know, and that kind of struggle together then makes... You know, you kind of find out a little bit about that person and you have that shared value. Whereas I find with football, I, I, I can't really explain it or t- articulate it well of why, but it, it definitely is a very different feeling to football. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's an interesting point. I'm just trying to think now actually why that would be different. Because I agree yeah. that my experience playing football when I was younger was nowhere near the same. It's, it's not, not same. it's not the same. And uh, again, I've never really played rugby to a good level, but I think rugby has a very good community as well. And again, it might be because it's a savage sport. It's oxytocin. <laughs> <laughs> it's a physical contact, mate. Yeah. No, I don't know what it is, but that that's the truth. That's that's just how it is. Yeah, mate. But no, it was a good episode again. And uh yeah, that's that's brings us up to date, mate. So um so yeah, so we'll put this out this one out. Um it should be sort of episode twenty 24, 25. Um, at the point of recording this, we, we did put out a and a as well um, to celebrate our 20th episode, which we'd released at the time. But um, by the time this actually, you'll be watching this, we would have had 23 episodes out at least. Um, so yeah, so it's been, uh, it's gone quick, mate. I mean, it, it feels like fucking yesterday that we were bumbling our way through that, fu- that first reflection oh, episode no, that we did. Oh, no. um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I can't remember the stats again. I won't bore people with them because everyone will give a shit. But, Achieving twenty video podcast episodes is 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 quite a feat. Like people, I think it, it doesn't sound like a lot because people will compare us to the really big, you know, well established podcasts that have been going for years and years. But achieving twenty recorded, produced, released episodes, I think that was definitely a little bit of a, a benchmark and a milestone for us, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know, when we, I know we have our long term goals for this thing, and and we're not going anywhere. So <laughs> keep watching, keep listening, and we're going to keep trying to grow. But I think, uh, like like you said, I, th- I can't remember the st- statistic exactly, but it was it was super low, wasn't it? It was under like fucking ten percent. I think under five. Under five. Percent. Under five yeah. percent of video podcasts release twenty episodes. Yeah, because it's fucking yeah. hard, mate. I think yeah, a lot is, of people yeah. will see like this, this production yeah. and think it's easy, mate. And it's there's a lot of like a lot of time, money, planning that goes into this, a lot of effort. Yeah. And it's a lot of effort getting good guests on. And all our guests have been, uh, they've offered something. And I think that with our podcast as well, we're not just looking to, people say to me, oh, get this guy on, get this, you know, he's got, you know, you got James English, anything goes and he'll get, a porn star on and talk about her life and but we're we're specifically looking at uh helping men you know we're really looking at that sort of avenue and what we're passionate about so we're not saying that we're never going to get these interesting stories on of course we are you know because a lot of the guys on have got interesting stories and uh, you know but we want it to be good information that you can take away and learn something and try and better your life with you know not just you know stories are (laughs) <laughs> are just are just stories you know what I mean and things like that so I think that's our big big aim isn't it is to try and push good information through those channels yeah I think every single guest that we've ever considered we ask ourselves the one question which is will they add value to yeah. our audience you guys which are primarily men yeah. Um, so so yeah hopefully it's uh, hopefully you're benefiting guys and you appreciate the effort we do because um, yeah I mean it takes a bit of time but it's well worth it so that's uh, let's, let's wrap it up um, before we do though guys again like we said we really appreciate the support um if you're enjoying the content please subscribe to the channel like this video it goes a long way i think probably more it probably goes up a long you know more than more than you realize it it really supports the channel It, it gives us the ability to get more guests on um and bring you better content so yeah peace so we'll yeah see you on the next one cheers guys thank you